Hi everyone, this is the Brattleboro Literary Festival right in your living room this year because of, as everyone knows, we have a very strange, weird, dystopian reality right now. Um, we're going to be talking to Andre Dubuse the third and Jill McCorkle in the next hour, and I can't, I can't wait. They're going to read a little bit to you, and then they're going to ask each other questions about their work and go into kind of one of those genius conversations that we all learn so much from. We get to be flies on the wall. I'm Suzanne Kingsbury, and I'm one of the hosts for this weekend's uh, 2020 Brattleboro Literary Festival online. We're also making sure that this goes live, or not live, but recorded on YouTube for you guys. So if you know people who want to see Andre and Jill, uh, it will be on the BrattleboroLiteraryFestival.org. And you can watch anything, anything on the festival. And this festival is kind of the Porsche of um, literary festivals. I mean, everyone who comes is is really, really, really high level. So it's something to check out and you can watch it in your kitchen or in your living room or anytime. And I'm really honored this afternoon to be in the virtual room with Jill McCorkle and Andre Debus the third. This is an incredible pairing. I think some of us who are in the literary world would have sort of dreamt up this pairing and never thought it was possible, but here they are together. Um, and if I were going to go through all their awards and all their sort of accolades and bestseller statuses and fellowships and all that, we'd be here forever. So I'm just going to tell you that they are part of the literary pantheon. It's like, you know, sort of an event that's going to go down in history as far as I'm concerned. Their books um, are really some of the best storytelling of our generation. And both Jill McCorkle and Andre de Boost the third have changed, I think, the way our generation is telling stories. They sort of changed the domain in, in fiction and memoir both. So we're really lucky. And um, they're going to read a little first. I hope you guys will show your book covers so people can recognize them online and make sure you say um, their titles a couple times. And then um, just have at it. And if I like have a burning question, I'm going to come back on. You guys can send questions in the chat. And at about a quarter of the hour, we'll take questions from the chat from uh, for Jill and, and Andre. Okay, so you guys hit it. We're so happy to have you here. Okay, thanks. Thank, thank you for that lovely introduction, Suzanne. You're welcome, sweetie. Thank you. Who Great. should go first, Jill? I'm happy. I will go first. Um, I wish okay. we were in beautiful uh, Brattleboro. Anyway, here is my book with messy tags, uh, hieroglyphics. Um, and I'm really, it's great to see you, Andre. It's been a long time. And uh, I, I think we both deal a lot with um, memory and people looking back. And, and in hieroglyphics, I have four point of view characters, but um, two of the characters are an elderly couple who after living years in New England have retired to North Carolina. And the wife, Lil, is basically surrounded by everything she ever saved and, and kind of going through, sorting, um, kind of editing her life and deciding what she does and does not want her children to know. And so I'm, I'll read a little bit of Lil. We all are haunted by something, something we did or didn't do and the passing years either add to the weight or diminish it. Mine have diminished, perhaps because I've spent time thinking about it all. It might sound silly, but I see these bits and pieces as my contribution to evolution, the unearthing and dusting of the prints and markers that led me here. Some seem to bulldoze right through life and up to their headstones, but I want to take my time. I want to find the right words. I imagine my recipient to be you two or perhaps your children. And I hope this is so rather than some stranger who comes in and hoists old boxes into a dumpster or rakes away the remainders of my life like the sad debris in the aftermath of a flood or fire. 
I'll never get over the sight of what we left behind at our home of over 50 years to move down here. A mountain of cast off things, old towels and linens, papers and books and shoes and pots, side tables and lamps, hoses and hose, packets of seeds I meant to plant, and a rubber squeak toy that had been safely hidden away in the back of my closet by one of the dogs long dead, and so much more. Things not needed, things long forgotten, cans of cream of whatever soup and V8 juice, why? And peas that had sat there forgotten for years and things that never should have been there in the first place, like tuna helper or those things in my closet, like that geometric print mini dress I bought in the 60s, hoping to look like Petula Clark or Judy Karn, a perky pixie kind of dress that I never had the nerve to wear and instead looked at it there at the back of the closet for years, along with a wiglet and a long frosted fall and some jackets with shoulders resembling a football player or Victorian monarch. We divided it all into goodwill, consignment, recycle or landfill. But there were also the things I couldn't let go of, letters, reminders, souvenirs, and I'm taking my time, relieved when I find something that might have gotten lost in that mountain of debris, like one of your drawings from first grade or the stub from a movie I'd forgotten I even saw or a note from my father. When the moving van pulled away that afternoon and we got in the car and turned southward, the space within seemed so empty, vacant, our suitcases and silver chest in the trunk an overnight bag and thermos of coffee on the back seat. And I had that terrible feeling that I had forgotten something because I was thinking of all the times the car was filled with you two, your belongings, your music and voices, the dogs while going to school or on vacation or just to the grocery store where I bought all of those things that I then put on the shelf there in our dimly lit pantry on that red gingham contact paper I spent one snowy afternoon 40 years ago cutting and sticking in place all those things that I put there and then forgot about. In short, I'm homesick and I'm time sick. I would be lying not to say that. It's possible to feel content and resolved and still be homesick. I miss all that no longer is, which is why I paste and piece all these scraps together. I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely, beautiful. Um, you. All right, I guess I'll read and then we can have a conversation. Okay. That sounds uh, perfect. I'm going to read from uh, my most recent novel, Gone So Long. Um, came out uh, last year in paperback. And I'm just going to read the first, I think, page and a half or so. It's told in three points of view. The first one is Daniel. And welcome, everyone, and, and thank you. Uh, Brattleboro Festival for still being here. Once again, her name moves through Daniel's blood like floating debris. It scrapes along his bones and pokes at his old organs, and it is a steady pulsing nudge in his head. For days now, it has lodged itself in the searing ache in his hips and lower back, and he knows there's only one way to free it, but first he needs to finish these chairs he's caning under the sun. His eyes sting. His work glasses have slipped to the end of his nose. Daniel takes them off and lets them hang around his neck. He wipes the sweat off his forehead and stands to stretch his back, but the pain remains. The sickness deep inside him now. He can feel it. It's not going anywhere. He sits on his stool and puts his glasses on and gets back to work. Today, he notices his hands. There is old man's thick fingers chipped in yellowed nails, though his father's always had carnival paint in his cuticles that never came out. Daniel reaches for the nail file he uses to weave the cane under and over itself. A warm wind kicks up from the east and brings with it beach sounds, or maybe it's just Daniel's memory of them. The creaking gears of the Ferris wheel and the popping water balloons and the cries of gulls. There's the tinny whine of the carousel organ and the rattling jerk of the roller coaster cars, the shrieks of women and children hurled out over the hissing surf. 
But always there comes, rising up from inside him and getting louder, the blaring rock and roll of the Himalaya. Sugar, sugar, proud Mary. Tommy Rowe singing, he's so dizzy, his head is spinning. Yesterday, after months of thinking about it, Daniel finally drove around the midway, and it isn't half what it used to be. The wooden roller coaster was torn down years ago, and the Ferris wheel they have now is kitty-sized, the Himalaya gone, though there's a strip club with tall white columns at the doors. Half a block down from that, in the front window of a souvenir shop, a male mannequin in swimming trunks stands among beach towels and hula hoops under a two-month-old hand-lettered sign, Father's Day Sale, Half Price. Daniel hasn't seen his daughter in 40 years, and there is so much to tell her, but why would she listen? Thank you. Oh, that's so wonderful. Yeah, you know, but both of our novels deal a lot with um, parent child relationships and, mm -hmm. and trying to look back and understand what we somehow missed. Um, of my elderly couple, um, they each lost a parent in childhood to a catastrophic event. And I, I used as the backdrops um, the, a, a train wreck that happened in my native North Carolina County in 1943. And um, and also the Coconut Grove fire in Boston in 42. Um, and so they both sort of went to bed one way, woke up another. And, and um, I have to say, reading your novel, I was so taken with Daniel's father, Liam. And you know, it's just all through the, the reference there to the nails, but the, that carnival backdrop and, mm -hmm. and um, Mm. This sort of artistry of, I, I mean, the carousel description was just so, so beautiful. And um, there's you. just that same kind of layering, you know, how um, it's hard to fully um, get the whole of a character without tracing back to those earlier roots. Yeah, let, well, for, thanks for those beautiful words. And I love your settings are always so so vivid and evocative and alive and textural, Jill. And it makes me think about, you know, I, I find myself saying this in, in writing classes, if, if the heart of character-driven story is character, then if, if you don't have a real place, your characters, the, the place is the lungs and your characters literally can't breathe if you don't put them somewhere real. Um, you know, I was thinking about, I, you know what, I got to get out of this sun right in my face. Here, how's that? That's better. That's good. All right, good. Um, I was on a panel not long ago, uh, and, and one of the writers is a very famous mystery writer, and he said, hey, it was, a, it was a conference. He was telling the participants, hey, don't for, forget the flashbacks, forget going back in time. Okay. Just start your first page and just put them in an action and put them forward and forget going backwards. And I'm sitting there quietly thinking, I just can't do that. <laughs> it got me thinking of, uh, and it's good advice. And it, it is always a snappy way to begin a novel and some sort of action and things move forward. But, you know, I think about that famous Faulkner line from Requiem for a Nun, which is often quoted, uh, the past is never de dead. It isn't even past. Right. What do you think of that, Jill? I mean, to me, I, I, it, like right now, I bring every every moment I've ever had, as we all do, to this conversation we're having. No, that's that's where I am as well. And I mean, I keep death side and have for for over twenty years now. Kierkegaard's life must be lived forward, but it can only be understood backwards. And <laughs> my characters are, I I can't think of a character not immersed in some way by those early childhood memories mm -hmm. and and what what in fact shapes the present moment mm -hmm. and um i see it all of a piece and so yeah when i hear when i hear people sort of groan over backstory i i feel this sort of personal affront because i feel like so much of my work is backstory. I mean, and progressively so. I mean, I, you know, I have written my past two books are very much about memory. Mm -hmm. And I think it's what interests me most, not just as a writer, but as an observer of other people's lives. 
I, I totally agree. And I, I think of the word uh, to remember. And, and this, this really came up for me when I wrote my accidental memoir, Townie, a few years ago. And, and, you know, the opposite of to remember is not to forget. As you, as you may know, if you look at the Latin, the opposite of the word to remember is chop, 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 dismember. Dismember. And so, so, for, so the act of remembering is actually, and you just said of a piece, it is actually the act of reaching for the shards of our experience, is reaching for the pieces. I mean, if you go to therapy, the therapist will do the same thing. <laughs> I've read, this is what happens. They'll draw you out, right? And they'll, and they'll ask you to reach for the pieces to try to put the story back in, in a hole. So I'm totally with you on that. How did, uh, what was the seed for this particular novel, Jill? Do you remember? Uh well, actually, the, the seed came um, with those two catastrophic events. My, my dad, as a, you know, an adolescent, had gone with many people to look at the aftermath of this train wreck, um, which, which was on the front page of every national newspaper in this tiny little hamlet. Um, you walk the tracks now, you would never know that this accident happened. And yet, you know, 79 people killed and many people from New England, many people were heading to Lowell, in fact. Wow. Um, soldiers, World War II soldiers. And so all these lives were upended. And there's not much to read about it, but what you do read every time it comes to this catalog this list of how people were identified over time and it's the most insignificant things you know it's a little note in the pocket it's a dry cleaning tag it's what's inscribed in a wedding ring mm. and 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 i was just always so completely intrigued by how intimate you know a shoe becomes after the fact mm. and and then flash forward, you know, I moved to, to Boston and lived there 20 years and I no sooner got there, but I heard people talk about the Coconut Grove fire in a similar mm -hmm. way. It became a before and after mm -hmm. of a whole society and the many, many lives touched and people again were identified in a very similar way. They were identified by just tiny, um, articles of clothing or a scar that told the story of of the past and and so I mean that's not an idea for a novel obviously but I was so intrigued by how it filters down um to the next generation you know these children who a, a big chunk of their history gets wiped out and this is all they have this is all they know but I do think it's it, it's a perfect example of a really good idea for a novel. You know, I think too often that younger writers are not so young in life, but maybe at the craft think they have to have it all figured out and they've got to know what the hell they're doing. And I, I, I love Rumi's line, uh, sell your cleverness and purchase bewilderment, you know, and, and, and I've learned to trust what I'm bewildered by, what I'm curious by. And don't you find you, all we need is just a little floor, a little fauna little sliver of something and then if you go into it with curiosity it can open doors absolutely and and also i mean if your if your purpose is something a little more seemingly abstract like uh if this character appears negative where do you find the positive and vice versa you know what what's the achilles heel on this person who appears saintly and um mm. <laughs> right achilles heel yeah. I, always, I always say tendon and get it all screwed yeah, yeah. What, yeah. um he was it, held in the dip yeah the dip. um so you know i'm i'm always looking for that balance and and um certainly you you are a writer who seeks a kind of redemption i think because um you know i came away from gone so long really um with great sympathy for everyone everyone in there 
Well, thank you, Jill, so much. I, I, maybe I should. And that was not, that was not easy to come oh. to that, given Dan, you know, given the past. But um, you you really found redemption, and I don't want to give away plot things. Well, maybe I'll, I'll I'll tell the the viewers uh, how this one started for me. Um, and again, it was just a sliver of a of a situation in a moment, uh, as it was for you with those personal little pieces of evidence of a life lived and lost. I was working on a screenplay. I'm not a screenwriter, but it was it's a long story, but I was hired to write an essay about a, a real man doing real time in a mass, Massachusetts prison. And I interviewed him at Walpole and I'll, I'll condense this. What, what made the story interesting for me was he totally transformed himself over 25 years in prison, became a good person. I mean, a, a fine citizen, so much so anyway. Um, so I'm doing this project. I'm interviewing a guy in a major city far away from where I live in the Boston area who had done 15 years with my subject. And I was mainly interviewing him to get to know my, my younger subject better, but also to learn more prison details. And, and the guy was in his 60s, the man I'm interviewing. Um, he you know got out of prison decades earlier, and he was very warm, very personable. He was respectful to the waitress. That's always a litmus test for me to see how someone treats the the waiter or waitress serving us. And, and I, he gave me just great stuff over two hours. And um, I filled a notebook and I was buying him paying for the lunch. And and I I really like this guy. I felt like, hey, I may have made a new friend here. And I said, hey, look, I'm not supposed to ask, but why'd you do 15 years? I said, oh, I killed my wife. And Jill, I, uh, you know, thank God I'm not alone in this. I, I get so, violence against women by men puts me in a murderous temper. I, I just, I just, I get so angry at men who abuse and kill women. And so I just wanted to get away from this guy as quickly as possible. Uh, but we're walking down this hallway, this long hallway to the parking garage. And here's what I want to share with you all. I, I couldn't, I hated what he just told me, and I hated what he did, of course, but I couldn't deny that I still had enjoyed his company and that I still kind of liked him. So what do I do with that? So now we're just walking to the parking lot, and just to make conversation, I just want to get the hell away from him at this point. I said, well, do you have kids? And he said, oh, yeah, but they want nothing to do with me. And that is the sentence that floated in my psyche for three years and would not leave. And I wanted nothing to do with it. But so real briefly, for those of you who haven't read this book, it's three points of view. It's his point of view. He's sick. He's dying. He hasn't seen his daughter since she was three when he committed that horrible crime. The other two points of view are his 82-year-old mother-in-law, former mother-in-law who raised his daughter, her grandmother. And the other point of view is his 43-year-old daughter. Um, and so that's the, I did feel that morally, Jill, that if I was going to give him the microphone, I should have given at least two microphones to, to the victims. And, um, yeah, man, that, that, that <laughs> I'm glad that you found some redemption. I, I found myself hating, hating the sin, but not the sinner as I wrote this. Well, I, I, I mean, you, you did it and it, it puts us in that very complicated position because um, I, th I think we do see someone who has acknowledged, you know, what he did. And he was this other, you, you have that great line from Marie Howe. I got to look right here. Who was I when I used to call your name? Yeah. Uh, I love Marie's work. Don't you? So do you read a lot of poetry? Yeah. Oh, yeah. see, that's, I'm so glad to hear that. Too many fiction writers do not read enough poetry. I I totally agree. And some of the best storytellers are poets. Are and poets? it just trains the, the language. You know, I, I'm always asking my students um, to, re to read poetry. And Marie is a, such a wonderful storyteller. But, yes. but I was, that one line so captured... Um, because they all were different people, you know, and I think if you live long enough, if you have the privilege to live long enough, you're likely to come through several different versions of, yeah. of yourself. And, uh, you know, with, with Daniel, the scene, the scenes when he's with his dying mother, um, 
you know, again, it doesn't take away the crime, mm. but there is this genuine compassion and the way he's, um, you know, He's living, he's living his life. So any, anyone, you know, who wants an easy, uh, bad guy, good guy, uh, they're, they don't get it on the page with you. And I, I greatly admire that, you know, Thank you, Jill, do you, do you believe in good guys and bad guys? Cause I, I realized years ago that I don't believe. No, um, I, everybody is a blend. Everybody has secrets. We've all we've all failed in some way or another, and uh, I don't know about you as a teacher. I know I learned years ago when I would get the semester um, what evaluations. Mm -hmm. You know, I stopped reading them because you could get like twenty nine raves and then that one, and it would just <laughs> remember the bad one. My Christmas, you know, I'd be like, what, what. Because as humans, I think we just, so many of us, um, we're so stuck by our failures and mistakes anyway. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I guess I think that a, a positive ending or great resolution is a character who can admit to the truth. Mm -hmm. I love that word truth. Oh man, um, don't you? To their truth. And yeah and still move forward, you know, keep moving forward. You know, I've got a, uh, you, I'm sure you know this line from the lovely Willa Cather, American novelist. She said, artistic growth is, if nothing else, a refining of the sense of truthfulness. Yeah. Isn't that great? And yeah. I think my theology is actually a Tom Waits line from one of his songs, Heart Attack and Vine. And, and forgive me, anyone who might find this blasphemous, but it's my religion. There is no devil. There's just God when he's drunk. Mm -hmm. now, what I love about that is uh, I've never met a bad baby. We're all born full of light and needing to be loved. If you look at the word pervert, to pervert, it comes from the Latin. It means to turn away from. Right. Well, what are we turning away from? Love and light and all that good stuff. Yeah. Um, no, I, that's the example I always use in class, you know, I, um, with the sort of comic book good and evil you know um and looking for for that very natural blend and and the example i've used for years when this will date me but you know i always say charles manson was this tiny helpless infant you know mm -hmm. on this day and so then you ask as a writer i'm interested in so what happened between points a and b you know what takes a person mm -hmm there and it's not as simple as all of a sudden you know something happens i mean we see that on the news and then as soon as they start interviewing finally people start saying well i did notice this i mean i'm 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 a believer that there's always logic there there are always pieces that people must have missed or mm -hmm. or denied but seeing but do you do you share? I mean, I, I love psychology as a discipline, and Lord knows psychologists help all of us often throughout their working lives. But as a discipline, I I, I worry about. Um, I've seen my students too much over the years narrow um, a character's pathology down to one bad childhood event, and while, and and by the way, that was one of my fears in this novel, Gone So Long. Uh, I, I didn't want to be too reductive. Because you're right, it, it's all it's it's all of a texture. There is so there are so many factors to consider, um, but you know I think Freud it was misunderstood. I mean, not only was he a, a pioneer, actually thought well maybe a, a an adult's childhood is relevant to who the adult becomes. He was actually less interested in what happened to the child in his or her childhood as he was in what the adult thought about it. Mm -hmm. Or felt about it, which I th or remembered about it, which I think is really what novelists do, right? I mean, exactly. Yeah, and th there's that great line from Tobias Wolff's wonderful memoir, "This Boy's Life," where he says, "Memory has its own story to tell." Right. Isn't Such that beautiful? Yes, it is, and and true. I, oh, there's Suzanne. I was going to see what Suzanne had said. Hi, Suzanne. <laughs> I can't do two things at one time. I'm 
<laughs> oh, it's okay. I'm talking to the tech guy in the background. It's so funny that you guys are talking about this because I thought about it before you came on that you are able to sort of go into the, you know, the, the cities inside a person and and sort of see those like tunnels back into the past. I mean, we've gone so long. It's that feeling of, you know, that, that when the rage comes and it's like this sort of white hot rage that that guy feels. I, I was kept feeling like, how did he do that? Because what happens is the reader then is inside of that rage, probably in the same way that that he is, or that somebody who has that move inside them would be. But the writing is so good. It's because you forget your reading and you just feel like you're inside of this person who's having this experience of not being able to control. And then, and then you kind of, un, it's almost like you're doing it, you know, so there's no way not to feel that compassion for the violence almost, you know, which is so mm -hmm. interesting. And, and Jill too, with your work, I mean, with hieroglyphs, but also pretty much every book that I've ever read, I feel like, there's this deep intimacy with the characters that's beyond what's actually being said, you know, that we're inside of them and we know we're more intimate with them than they are with anyone else really in the scene. And so it, it gives us this almost like a, a, a powerful feeling, but in a good way, you know, and, 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 a, and as if we're best friends with them, but also them, you know, and Can I speak of that about Jill, because I love that Jill never judges her characters. Never. There's never any judgment. And, and I mean, and, and you're bringing up the word is right. Compassion, which is my favorite word in the English language. And of course, in the Latin, it means to suffer with, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's why it feels good as readers to read, you know, honest character driven fiction. Right. Because we, we we're all fallen. We all get up and try to be better people. We're all works in progress. And fiction's all about that. At least the, the kind of stuff that I know that Jill and I try to write. Yeah. And I think I think the closer you get, the harder it is to judge someone. You know, I mean, it's very easy if what you get is some distant sort of news account of, you know, a deed done. Um, but as soon as it, we're introduced again to those intimate objects um, that surround this person or you know what that person loves, uh, it, we're looking at a very different picture. Yeah, absolutely. And we need it right now. Compassion, probably more than anything else, like, a, you know, the activism of it. OK, so we have some questions for you guys. One of them is from Joanne Rhodes who wrote um, a question for Andre and then um, Jim and Tink, who wrote one for both of you. So she, Joanne really wanted you to say a little bit more, Andre, about that beautiful, which I caught too, the setting and the place being the lungs and, and how yeah. you breathe and weave the plot and characters and action into the story. Yeah, that, that would be so great to hear a little bit about that. Well, you know, uh, I, I think about a wonderfully helpful line that I use in my classes too by the writer Ron Carlson. He said, the details are for the writer only. They're the instruments by which we steer. And we know part one is hyperbole. Ultimately, of course, you want to give the, the reader a feast. But this whole notion of, like right now, I'm sitting in my bedroom in the woods of Newbury, Massachusetts on a late uh, autumn afternoon with the sun coming in on my face. If I just, if instead of the sun coming in through the bare trees out there, uh, we had a windstorm and rain pelting the glass, it would change our entire conversation. It would change what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling. And so I found that that whole Carlson line is very, very helpful. The instruments by which we steer, you know, I, so often I will, you know, I'll read work that there's no weather in it. So you guys, the weather is so important. Weather and money are two very important things. You can't sit around talking all day. Someone's got to pay the bills. How do you guys make a living? Where's the money come from? And what's going on outside? <laughs> I mean, those two things can totally, right, Jill, engage the character and change the direction of the narrative. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, just the, the attention given to an occupation or like what you read, you know, he's caning a chair. And then there's this whole process. But yeah, I'm big on weather always, you know, and um, because it, 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 it well, it it's it, yeah, it changes our entire day. It, it, it totally shapes the day. 
and the mood yeah emotional yeah mood yeah so so that's that's really great that's such a great answer and uh jim mentink says um this is a great discussion which it really is you guys oh my gosh it's so exciting to be listening in um and and he's saying not enough praise can be given for two established writers talking craft and that's so true he's wondering if you guys can tell us a little bit about what kind of habits outside of writing you think writers should develop beyond curiosity that could strengthen strengthen their prose? And I think Jill, you kind of touched on it a little bit with poetry and memorization, and yeah, yeah. And you know, I'm a compulsive note taker. Um, I think I used to be able to hold a lot more in my head, but uh, as soon as my my daughter was born, now 31 years ago, um, uh, the ability to remember well uh, started leaving. So I, I just, I'm a compulsive note taker and I never know where it will, where it will go. You know, I'll hear over here that funny line of dialogue and by now I actually put it in this book finally um, because for almost 20 years or I've had this line where I walked into the dry cleaners and the woman behind the counter looked at me and she said the humility has been awful hasn't it <laughs> yes, <funny. laughs> yes terrible humility um, you know, and, and at the time I'm like, whose mouth will this come out of? I don't know. But, you know, I sort of keep that comedy file, those little bits of comic relief. So you overhear funny things like that, or, or you know, I might see, um, see somebody by the side of the road, you know, you pass these houses and you there's a part of your mind that wants to like go into those windows. And sometimes you almost feel like you can see that room if you let yourself or see where that person's going. And, and when that experience happens, that's when I sort of um, either ride on the steering wheel, which the mechanic told me to stop doing so I don't deploy the thing um you know you pull off and you make as many notes as you can and i and again i have no idea where those notes will end up but it's become such a habit in life um that i sort of feel naked without a pen in my pocket and and some scrap of paper well can i can i speak to that because it's, it's really important um of course there's a wonderful line from a Mary Oliver poem. Um, Pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. And, you know, I'm, I don't, I'm not going to get on my soapbox. Um, I hate iPhones. I won't call them smartphones. I don't, I don't own one. I've never sent a text. I've never been on social media. I, I think they've put us all in a trance and they've, it, there's even a psychological term. Everybody, everybody's walking around in a state of continuous partial attention. And so I do think that writers, you know, Henry James is the one who said, try to be one on whom nothing is lost. I think it's really important to be present. And it is why I, I will never own an iPhone. I have, I have a flip phone and I lost it uh, two months ago. My life hasn't changed a bit. But um, I think it's really important to be present. We don't know how long we have. Maybe we each get 140 years. But just all we have is right now. Let's be here now. And um, I would also say, then, and read your ass off. <laughs> yeah. Read, 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 read some more, right? You are what you eat. Yeah. That's beautiful. Read, read each other. So, okay, Wynn Cooper's here. Hi, oh, Wynn. Brother so Wynn. How are you here? Oh, beautiful poetry. I know we miss you on the on the festival. Okay, so he's he's read your book, Andre, and he's reading Jill. Okay, I have to tell a story about Wim Cooper. It'll take me thirty seconds. He told me when I told him how much I love your work, Jill. He said to me, "Oh my God, I went to graduate school with her." And every day she would get in her little car at the end of the day, and she would race home. And I would always wonder where she was going. And finally, she told me it was to watch her soap operas. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, that's why she's such a good storyteller. It was the days of Luke and Laura. I mean, <gasps> they 
I watch them too. I swear they help us write, I think. So he wants to know. Quinn tells all my secrets. He tells everyone's secrets. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we love him. That's why we want to have drinks with him. Okay, so what made you guys, now you're like the, you know, this celebrated author with all these awards. And so you showed him, Jill. So <laughs> what made you decide to write from multiple points of view, he wants to know. And uh, did you start the novels that way or? After you, Jill. I, I knew mine. Um, with multiple points of view because there there are sort of secrets and different um, interpretations that that sort of are missing each other among the characters and and I was interested in both representing the end of life with this elderly couple and on the other end I have a single mother and a six year old son and the six year old is also point of view. And I just love those extreme ends because I think they have a lot in common, um, filterless at either end, you know, for better or worse. And um, so I knew that I wanted to represent the span of mm -hmm. life and, and not fully knowing how they would overlap or intertwine, but I always knew. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, I had more people and they, they had to go on a vacation. They'll have their own book someday. That's great. When, first of all, hello, my friend. I love your poetry. I'm very fond of you as a human being. Um, I think one of the things I love about the novel form is the ability to go into many heads and hearts. And, and I've done it in every novel except one. And um, with this one, I, I particularly wanted, if, I'm, if I was going to go into the 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 interior life of a man who murdered his wife when he was when they were both young and she never got to age. Um, I I felt morally compelled to explore the damage done to two people in that family, his daughter and his wife's mother. So I felt morally compelled to explore. But also, there's this wonderful line from a moment from Alfred Hitchcock. He said, "Look." I can film two men in a diner booth slowly eating breakfast, and then I can blow them up. He said, well, that's shock value. Or I can film them slowly eating breakfast, and then the camera can pan to the paper bag three feet away with the ticking bomb in it. Back to the, you know, he, he said, now that's dramatic tension. And the truth is, the more the, the reader knows, I think, the greater your chance of creating dramatic tension. And so um, that's another reason why I did it. I I read Remains of the Day not long before I started writing this beautiful, you know, masterpiece, right? And um, the entire novel is from the point of view of the man going to find the woman uh, he's pining for. Um, I don't want to ruin it. I, I won't spoil it if people haven't read it. But um, we don't hear from her. And I thought I would love to hear from her. And so that's also why I did the two, three points of view in that one. Mm -hmm um that's fascinating to hear about that i mean that's a lot to keep in your brains <laughs> All these but, it does, but it does automatically create tension so, mm -hmm. you know as you shift back and forth it, it does yeah and it also feels only fair to me <laughs> I, I i like when someone's not hogging the mic although i just finished reading lolita the entire novels from humbert humbert's point of view and my God, you can't put it down. It's as horrible as that experience is. Well, and also you can't afford to see some the other reality there, you know, when you're immersed in his world or it would greatly change. Yeah, because he's a deeply unreliable narrator. Right, He's a, and, and, and part of the magic of that voice is he hasn't got a clue about it except for a couple moments. I recommend that masterpiece by Nabokov for anyone who has not read it. If you can get past the horribly di disturbing nature of what we're talking about, which is pedophilia. Mm. And then um, Christian Jacob also read, uh, wrote and asked Andre if you were aware of Norman Mailer helping a prisoner who wrote yes. Belly and the Beast and he eventually yeah. committed a murder and went back to prison. Yeah, terrible story. I, I forget, uh, it was pretty famous. Uh, yeah, so Mailer uh, befriended this guy who was a really talented writer, this inmate, and I think because of Mailer's influence, was able to get this man a furlough, 
took him out to dinner and the guy snapped and stabbed the waiter to death. It's just the worst. And so, look, I, I, I'm glad whoever asked that question did, because I think it's really important that people I think so often we you know, I don't want to get on crime fighting here, but you know, it is possible to hate the sin and not the sinner. It is possible to hold someone totally accountable for his or her actions, uh, and some of whom should never leave a prison ever again. Uh, and it's also in the same hand possible to have compassion for them as human beings, which yeah. is simple but not easy. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting to think about that while we're dealing with what's on the world stage. So it's yeah. Interesting to end with that. Um, you got a you too. I, I just I can't thank you enough. This was incredible. Okay. You have 63 people watching you. Thank you so much for coming. And please tell everyone to come and watch the replay at the Brattleboro Literary Festival dot org. Buy hieroglyphs, Jill McCorkle's book and anything by her and buy, and buy Andre DeVoose the third's books. He has many out there that you guys are just going to stay up all night reading and you'll forget about the pandemic just for a little while, maybe. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. you. And it's so good to see you. So good to great see to you. see you, Andre. And when... Great yeah. to know you're you're there, <laughs> and um, and all the people who attended. Thank you so much for stay um, healthy, everybody. Suzanne, thank you. Jill, congratulations on your new book. It's wonderful. Thanks. Hieroglyphs, you guys. Buy it, buy it, buy it. You will love it. Okay. Mwah. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Good to so see much. you guys. Bye, sweetie. Bye.